held onto my self-will. Without it, I reason, I would have no control over my life, and could not survive. It was pointed out to me that perhaps that was the whole problem. I was told that perhaps I should seek God's will first, and then conform my will to His. Today, I pray only for His will for me and the power to carry it out on a daily basis, and all is well. I have found that His gifts are without number when I consistently turn my will and my life over to His care. I have found a new home in the Fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. My life again has meaning. I have found that I have but one calling in life and that is to carry the message to the addict who still suffers. I am so grateful to God and N.A. that I may do this today. I have found that you are just like me. I am no longer better than or less than. I feel a real love and camaraderie in the N.A. Fellowship. My great spiritual awakening has been that I am an ordinary addict. I am not unique. There are still those who refuse to join us and take the path that we have chosen, because they feel that they are unique. They may die, but may God bless them too. I found a home 105. I found a home. From the time I was a little girl, I can remember feeling like I didn't quite belong. I thought I must be an alien from another planet. It seemed that I always said and did the wrong things at the wrong time. I felt a big empty hole inside of me, and I spent the next 20 years trying to fill it. I always wanted desperately to fit in somewhere. I always seem to feel better being one of the guys, so I usually just stayed around men. I didn't really understand or trust girls. I had a very low self-image. I realize now that I hated myself. I wished I could be somebody, anybody, other than me. I felt like a loser and, looking back on it, that's probably why everybody treated me like one. I was a victim by choice, but I didn't know it. The first drug I ever used was vodka, after which I blacked out, and then passed out. The first time I smoked marijuana was the same way. I had heard marijuana didn't do much, so I smoked four joints in a row just to make sure. It worked. It didn't take long for me to find harder drugs and start using them. I was afraid of a lot of things, but trying out new drugs wasn't one of them. More and more I now started to depend heavily on drugs to make me feel better, or at least different. I guess that I wanted to get loaded and stay that way forever. The longer I got loaded, the more it seemed people were getting in my way. After a while it seemed everybody was against me. I decided people were my problem, and I didn't want anything to do with them. I thought I needed money to be free of my problems, so I went to work. I was 15 and was determined to make enough money, so I wouldn't need anybody ever. I could just get loaded and stay that way with no one to hassle me. During the time I was getting loaded, I tried a lot of different lifestyles hoping to fit in somewhere. I went to San Francisco to become an intellectual, sipping espresso and reading poetry. I tried to be a hippie, a nurse. 105. 106 Narcotics Anonymous Mama, a river rat and a desert bunny. I spent a while driving around in Cadillacs with lawyers and stockbrokers. No matter where I went or the company that I kept, I was loaded, and I was still me. Nothing seemed to fit, and I always ended up alone. I drank, dropped, snorted, 
smoke, and sniffed my way through the next seven years until something terrifying began to happen. I could take more and more and more drugs, but I was passed out before I ever got that good feeling. I guess that the feelings which I had always run from could not be pushed down any longer. They were eating me alive. I tried and tried to use more to get that good feeling back, but all I got was more and more afraid. I didn't know what was happening to me. I couldn't turn my head off. I became more and more afraid of people until I was just living like a hermit. I felt a lot of humiliation and degradation during my addiction. I did a lot of things loaded which I am grateful that I don't have to do today. In the last few years, before I got to Narcotics Anonymous, I really believed I was going insane. I was intent on self-destruction. I tried suicide many times. In desperation, I went to a psychiatrist. Usually they can be of little help to addicts, but this man, thank God, knew about this program. He said, I can't help you, you're an addict. I was shocked. I had always thought drugs were the answer, not the problem. Didn't everybody take drugs? Drugs were my life. I didn't know how to give them up. He told me about a hospital where I could get help. I could no longer work or care for myself. I knew that I was crazy. I was physically, emotionally and spiritually empty, and I was very, very scared. At my first Narcotics Anonymous meeting, I knew that I had come home. I had finally found people who were just like myself. I was still scared of everyone, but somehow I knew that this was my last chance at life. If I couldn't make it here, it would be the end for me. Three times I had 89 days clean, only to use again. My disease was more powerful than I had ever imagined. What scared me is that now I really wanted to stop, but found I could not. Finally, I realized I was still trying to do it alone. I could not stay clean without these people. They had something that I desperately wanted. I had heard that if I put as much into the program as I did into using then I could make it. I found a home 107. I got closer to the program and got a sponsor and called her every day. I went to meetings every night, started to work the steps, and just hung on. Through the grace of God I have not taken a fix, pill or drink for five years. Desperation drove me to Narcotics Anonymous, and desperation is what has kept me coming back. I am grateful for the bottom that I finally hit, because it gave me the willingness to work the steps, go to meetings, and just, live one day at a time. I used to wonder, what am I going to do if I don't get loaded? Today it seems like there aren't enough hours in the day. I have real friends today, including girlfriends, and they are very special to me. The program is my life today. All the pain that I felt during my using led me to more pain, but every ounce of pain that I experience in the program, staying clean, brings me more growth, and more peace. The only way that the empty place inside me can be filled is through the steps of this program. The things that I have learned since coming here would fill this book. I did not know how to live, and the program is teaching me for the first time. I am finally facing the old enemy, me. I am learning to accept myself, and even to like myself, a day at a time. I know today I need the people in Narcotics Anonymous, the ones who were here before me, and those who have come in after me.
I don't feel that I can ever fully repay what this program has given me, because it gave me my life. Thank you NA for being there. 108 Narcotics Anonymous. If you want what we have. My name is Bill, and I'm a junkie and a juicer. For many years of my life, I felt that the world had dealt me a cruel hand, which left me with many inadequate feelings. Fear ate a hole in me that I was never able to fill with drugs and alcohol. I was born in Alabama in 1933. My father's job required constant moving, which meant new clothes and new faces. I was small and sickly and my insecurities and inadequacies around people increased. I fought these feelings verbally and with my fists. Punishment in some fashion followed me everywhere. My father died when I was seven, and I remember the hate that I felt because he had left an only child to fend for himself. A grandmother, aunt and mother spoiled me rotten. Every time the church door was open, I was there. At the age of ten, everyone in the family thought baptism was in order. I didn't feel any different when I got up than when I knelt down. Control was the name of the game. I tried to control everyone in our little family and outside, including the nun who caught me stealing cold drinks in a convent. Another form of punishment that I felt was rejection. My mother married a man who later proved to be an addict. We moved to another city, and the war within me intensified. Continuous fighting at home created more fear and insecurity. When I was away, I hated my home and resented the people in it. Drawing upon different concepts, I began another way of living. It did not matter to me to what lengths I had to go in order to gain love and approval from everyone. Up went the false front with more dishonesty and deception. I was to spend many years of my life trying to be something that I was not. Relief came at the ripe old age of 16 in the form of alcohol at a dance. Immediately my fear of girls was gone. My two left feet disappeared, and I knew exactly when and where to lay my newfound wisdom of people. The effect left, and I was back at war with me. 108. If you want what we have 109. I believe rules were made to be broken. Society's laws were not for me. They hampered my way of living, and I began to deal with reality the only way I knew, and that was using the drug alcohol. This is the only drug I was aware of in the late 40s, and I used it to ease the pain. At the time, it was the best way to cope with them. Anyone could punch my buttons if I thought that it was needed for their approval of me. After a small skirmish with school officials and city authorities, private school was necessary to finish high school. Two years of college proved even further that this world, and everything in it, was full of crap. I cared for no one at this stage of the game. However, I met a young lady who met all of my requirements. She was from an old family, very regal in appearance and possessed all of the social graces. We ran off and got married. I entered into a new relationship that I was not mature enough to handle. I fancied myself in the future as the old southern gentleman, broad brim hat, bowstring tie, overlooking his vast domain with a mint julep in one hand and a gold cane in the other. Material things were the basis for happiness in my life at this time. I looked either up or down to people, depending on their seeming net worth. After attaining a lot of these things, 
Happiness and peace of mind did not come. My salary as purchasing agent at a large hospital was not enough. Feeling to support my materialistic ambitions was necessary. The salesman soon found my vulnerable spot, wine, women and song. They began to supply my demand. Drinking and partying every night soon made a physical wreck out of me. In the latter part of 1954, I was introduced to a little goodie called Codeine by a salesman to draw a clean breath. Something was cruising in me every moment of every day. I was 21 years old and a full-blown addict. Routine encounters of addicts and alcoholics treated at the hospital convinced me that I was unique. I would never become like they were. The standards and expectations I set for myself and others were too high to be met. Negative thinking and escapism became my total personality. Greediness compelled me to study drugs and experiment. This may have saved my life while I was using. I feared certain combinations in trying to get off. The 60s came along, and I decided I needed a change. I left the hospital for what I thought were greener pastures and began to travel. Life was still hell. That old nest of negativism followed me everywhere that I went. Jobs came and went, then they came no more. The jails and hospital stays were more frequent and longer. 110 Narcotics Anonymous In 1973, I came into a mental ward, I was chained like an animal. My psychiatrist, who I constantly conned over the years, knew of my alcohol problem, but not of my other addiction. It was suggested that I try a 12-step program. My family was willing to try anything, so off I went for all the wrong reasons. People were kind and helpful to me, so I began to use them as I had others all my life. They had never seen me clean and dry, so how were they to know if I was using? I was very careful not to talk about too much of anything lest they become suspicious. Deception and denial were the games that I played and they almost killed me. At this time I had gotten off the hard stuff and onto downers, uppers and mood elevators. People seemed happy and sober, and I wondered what they were using. I do not believe there was a fragment of honesty in me at the time. Willingness to change never crossed my mind. Gambling, women and using were my bag. For over three years I lived in hopelessness and despair going back to using, and going back to the program. After hearing the higher power concept and about a spiritual way of life, I knew drugs were not for me. I had at one time a God graciously given to me by my environment, whom I did not understand. I knew this God did not want anything to do with someone like me. There were times when I tried to relate, but there seemed to be something missing. I sincerely think that even though my feelings seemed to be the same as others, there seemed a lack of deeper understanding that I needed. God bless them they tried. There were no recovering addicts in the area and no N.A. I looked for people with other drug dependencies and finally found one lady in the group. She had spent 10 years in and out without any success. Things did get a little better. There were no arrests and no stays in the hospitals for a period of two years. Then, in the fall of 1975, everything went to pieces. Back to the hospital I went. Exchanging the alcohol for pills, I was back in the old paradox again. Then, a series of events began that changed my life. There was talk of committing me to the state institution. 
My family no longer wanted me like I was. Two program members came one afternoon to see me and they both told me the same thing, that I wasn't crazy, to come back, don't move, and ask for help. My sponsor, who had fired herself several times from my case, picked me up and took me to a meeting. The girl who rode with us spoke that night. She talked about God of her understanding. Sitting next to my wife that night I began to see where I had missed the boat. I went back to that. If you want what we have 111. Dark room and thank God for those people, because somehow I knew they cared. Even though they did not understand many things about me, they gave me time out of their lives and asked for nothing back. I remember the 11th step in the program and I thought maybe, just maybe, if I asked for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry it out, he might help. I got a little brave, I knew that I wasn't honest, I added, P.S., please help me get honest. It would be great to say that I left that hospital and never used again, but it didn't happen that way. It was almost like all the other confinements I had experienced. I came out of that hospital with exactly what I went in with, me. Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's passed just like a wink, blink and a nod, and I was still praying. Everything got worse. My family kicked me out the day after New Year's. I knew it was hopeless but I was still asking for honesty. On or around the 5th of January, I began to ease off the pills I was using. It wasn't any fun, but I know today that all the suffering was necessary. Praying and tapering off had become my obsession. I felt that this was my last chance. I took my last pill, shot, etc. in March. By God's grace I was clean. People began to tell me, look what you have done, and I began to believe them. I got to looking so good to me that I just invited me out for a drink. What a rude awakening. I came off that drunk full turkey, no pills, nothing, for the first time in over 21 years. For five days I shook and I mean shook. On the fifth day, I wanted no more. I sat down in my little VW, bowed my head and told God, if this is all in life for me, I want life no longer. Death will be far more merciful. It doesn't make any difference any longer. I felt a peace come into me that I had never felt. I don't know how long this lasted, and it doesn't matter. It happened and that is the important part. Since then, I have experienced the same feeling from time to time. It was like being brought forward from darkness to light. God doesn't let me stay in the sunlight too long, but he will help me if I choose to stay in the twilight. I walked away from that car a free man. I did not realize this for a long time. Since that day, I have not had a desire to move. A God of my understanding has sent me enough honesty to get started down the right path. I went back to the program and again I made another mistake. I kept my mouth shut with the intention of letting the winners teach me how to become clean. Today I know that for me I walked a different path through addiction, and I had to walk a different path through this program. I had to learn about me. For almost two years in the program. 112 Narcotics Anonymous. I saw people come and go with addictions other than alcohol. One night in Birmingham, I was sharing with a group and also talking about drugs when a man approached me with tears in his eyes. 
He told me of his son and daughter somewhere hooked on drugs. He said, surely God must have some program for people like them. All the way back home that night I talked to a girl using drugs, a schoolmate of my wife. The telephone gave us the answer through some new friends from Georgia and Tennessee in Narcotics Anonymous. A visit to Cher in Chattanooga proved to be a blessing. Several people came up from Atlanta, including one guy from Marietta who kept telling people that he loved them. I was 44 years of age at the time, that was the first time a man had ever told me that he loved me. For some unexplainable reason, I also felt his love. A couple of months later, we went to Atlanta and found a repetition of our first trip. I wanted so much to give and feel as these people did. At the close of the dance that night, I overheard something that went like this, if you want what we have, you have got to take the step. I came back to Alabama and began to take the step. I learned about me and found a God of my understanding. Trust God, clean house, help others, explain it as simply as I can. I spent many years looking for something around the corner, or someone coming down the street who would give me happiness and peace of mind. Today, through the steps and the people in NA, I have found a solution. I have to stay honest with me, stay open-minded enough to change and be willing to accept God's love for me through the members of NA. I am very grateful to our brothers and sisters in Georgia for their tolerance and support during our first year or so in the program in Alabama. They more or less sponsored me in those early days. Just knowing they were there was very comforting. Many times I called my friend in Marietta, despondent over the way things were going. He always seemed to have the answer. Keep the doors open and God will do the rest. NA groups now have sprung up in several cities and now those people are sponsoring me through their growth in NA and God's grace. I finally got it all together, but without God's help I forget where I put it. There is one thing that I feel I can give to every addict to use. I love each and every one of you, and most importantly, God loves me too. I found this love in the wonderful program of NA, through God's grace and you people. Come join us, it works. I qualify 113. I qualify. My name is Iris. I'm a drug addict. In the beginning of my clean time, I didn't think NA was the place for me. Then again, the stories from the other fellowship didn't relate to me either. I knew that I wasn't as bad as these dope fiends. Since that time, almost three years ago, my ideas have most certainly changed. I was the oldest of four children. I was the only one in my immediate family who had a drug problem. I figure that I started out as a pretty, happy kid. We didn't have much money, but we were close. Recently, someone said, a drug addict is nothing but an experienced escape artist. I can relate. My career of running or escaping started after a crisis at the age of 11. I went through a lot of pain and humiliation. At first I ran physically, later mentally. I escaped reality through books, TV, sleep, etc. I was very much a loner, but only because I felt no one wanted to be around me. I thought that I wasn't pretty enough, smart enough, rich or popular enough, and that I wasn't funny or witty enough. Everybody was better than I was. At home, I became the black sheep, causing embarrassment and shame. 
Once I tried to commit suicide thinking that the world would be better off without me. I started drinking and smoking pot heavily the summer after I graduated. I started a two-year college to be a secretary, because that's what a girl is supposed to be. In college, I couldn't handle the pressure. I went to a doctor complaining of headaches and was introduced to barbiturates. I started taking prescribed drugs. By the end of that first week I felt good. I felt so happy and carefree. I even liked Iris. The day was nice and fresh, and I even bounced when I walked. I remember looking at the bottle of pills thinking, I'm going to hold on to these. And I did faithfully for the next three years. To put it simply, I thought pills were the answer to my problem. Then the answer became the problem. There was no real fun involved. From the beginning, I was using pills to cope. I remember somewhere along that. 113. 114 Narcotics Anonymous. Line someone said, you're going to get addicted to those things. As long as they made me feel this good, I didn't care. Then I found out what addiction was really all about. After only six months of taking barbiturates daily, I remember going through my first withdrawal experience when I couldn't get anything. After that week, I thought I'd be starting over again. Little did I know, by this time, I had stopped drinking. I was a bit of a loner. Life was turning bad again. I had a car accident that I never dealt with. I started building a bigger wall around myself, and I needed something to calm me down enough to drive. I needed a little help to get me through work. I needed a little something for the courage to talk to people and even my family. Time became nothing but a gray haze where nothing seemed to matter. For me, therapy was a joke. I graduated college on the dean's list but couldn't sell myself, so I ended up with two part-time jobs. One was a Christmas job selling. There I learned to put on a show so that no customer would leave without a smile on their face. I felt that the show was all there was to my personality. In the other job, I was a clerk typist. Quickly, I came to believe that the girls there hated me. Out of fear, at a Christmas party, I decided to stop the pills and limit the drinks. By the end of the third drink, the party seemed to stop, and all I could think of was another drink. Back at the office, things got so bad that one day I came in with earplugs, and told everyone that I had an inner ear infection in both ears. If they wanted to talk to me, they had to tap me on the shoulder. That was one of the last bricks in my wall, blocking out the world. At home, I slept 10 to 12 hours a day. I tried to control and to even stop drugs, but I couldn't. I wondered what happened to the flower children and drug addicts of the 60s. Were they all dead? And what was going to happen to me? Depression was a normal state of mind. There was no conversation between me and my family. My only enjoyment in life was watching TV. I remember rocking back and forth in bed thinking, no one knows loneliness like I do. I felt like a walking corpse. The only emotion that I had was hate and that was directed at myself. Later, I found out everyone was waiting for me to commit suicide, they didn't know what to do. The only thing I remember of my family at that time was that my dad hated me. In that gray haze, my mom was a warm soft light that was out there somewhere. 
She always seemed to love me no matter what I did. I didn't understand. I qualify 115. When the time came that my higher power took control of the situation, against my will, a series of events happened that got me to break down and turn to my mom for help. I said, Mom, I think I have a problem with drugs. She said, Well, we're going to the doctor's today. Maybe he can give you something to help. We were so ignorant, but it felt so good to share and cry. Things then started to move quickly. First came detox. I loved it. My own room, TV, telephone, and all the hot water I wanted. My own private world. I didn't have to deal with anyone. I only went to a rehabilitation center so that I wouldn't have to return home so quickly. I started to get into a romance until someone asked me, what do you have to offer him? I didn't have much to offer at that time, and I knew it. I did learn about drug addiction and was given some tools. Again, I only went to the halfway house because I didn't want to go home and back to my old way of life. At the halfway house, I learned how to live clean and to use the tools of recovery. The main tool, the basis of my clean time, was meetings. I attended my first NA meeting in the rehabilitation center. The only thing that I remember about that meeting was a man who looked so good that if he spoke to me, I'd melt. Later, I was told that it doesn't matter why you come in the beginning, just come. So I came. And I strutted, and I smiled, and I did what I took for a cookie, a compliment, a look, or a stroke. My ego needed anything it could get. At that time, I still didn't really know what being clean was all about, but I kept coming back. Eventually, I started coming for me. I realized that I'm a drug addict even if I did not take a great variety of drugs. I may not have done the things other drug fiends have done. I may not have gone as far down the road, but only because I didn't have the opportunity. I am a drug addict, not only because of the drugs, but because of the defects as well. Because of the lying, manipulating, conniving, self-will, thieving, and escaping, I qualify for this program. I also found that drugs were only a symptom of my disease. With meetings, help from the people in those meetings and my higher power, I started to grow. I got rid of the fear and the guilt. My confidence was restored. I learned to handle pressure and responsibility. I learned to reach out one hand for help and the other hand to help. I learned to make friends, and I learned to respect myself. I could go on and on. I'm growing by using the tools of the program. Thank God for the NA program. I'm alive. I'm free, and today, I have a lot to offer. 116 Narcotics Anonymous Why ME? Why not ME? My God, what am I doing here? Why am I in so much trouble? What am I going to do? Nothing had gone right for me in such a long time. Was I going crazy? Was there hope for me in this horrible existence that I called life? The only words that I could use to describe my life are fearful, desperate, aimless, and hopeless. As I thought of my past with remorse and disgust, I tried to think of anything that I had done or accomplished that was positive in any way. I had three beautiful children, a wife, two cars, a new house, and a good job. 
However, I could not think of a single thing in my life to be grateful for. I felt as though I was a complete failure, with nothing left to live for. For the past 14 years, I had been drinking heavily, and had experienced numerous consequences due to drinking, but I thought that was part of the game of being a responsible adult. I never liked responsibility and made a point to avoid it whenever possible. I was introduced to narcotics completely by accident. The accident was due to my drinking at 7 a.m. I suffered a broken neck in a head-on collision, and was taken to the hospital. I learned to enjoy the life, being waited on and having no responsibility. This was exactly what I had been looking for. Soap offers and narcotics. I recall the hospital staff telling me that I was an excellent patient. With all this encouragement, I devised many lies and cons to ensure a lengthy stay at their wonderful institution. Little did I know that I was setting a pattern of thinking that was to last many years. This pattern would be a very destructive force to my family and lifestyle. After being released from the hospital, I returned to alcohol. I thought I missed all the benefits of having a good time, so I went after all the gusto that I could handle. Gusto brought countless days and nights spent praying to the porcelain altar, smashed fingers in car doors and fights with my wife and family. All this, just to escape responsibility. As I continued to become more insecure with my actions and attitude, I went even deeper into the bottle. I felt as though there was something horrible always ready to happen to me. 116. Why me? Why not me? 117. I was seemingly satisfied with my alcohol use, and only occasionally thought of drugs. I still thought about the wonderful treatment that I received at the hospital, and occasionally fantasized myself back there being a wonderful patient. For a period of six years, I had been unable to laugh and enjoy living. I was just a miserable human shell. My attitudes were negative, and I had started to suffer physically, acting out my fantasies, and looking for sympathy. Recalling the thought of my treatment in the hospital, I was impelled to seek medical help for my ailment. I had developed stomach ulcers, due to what I thought was a bad diet and a very demanding job. I had begun to have problems with my knees, because I seemed to fall down a lot. After playing a good con on the doctor, I was finally hospitalized for tests. This was the beginning of the end. I had been able to convince the doctors that I was suffering from incurable and painful diseases. When I was released from the hospital, I was given prescriptions for various kinds of narcotics and downers to help me eliminate my suffering. I continued drinking alcohol while I took drugs. I became such an excellent patient that I was hospitalized 23 times in 4 years. During this time, I had surgery after surgery. I even had my stomach removed. All these surgeries ensured my drug supply. I was becoming a physical, mental, and spiritual mess. The constant conflict inside of me was more than I could deal with. With an ever-increasing amount of narcotics, I was able to function as a human being. I would even convince my children to watch their dad use a needle with his medicine, so that they would not hear the needle when it was their turn to get medicine. In the fall of 1979, I had an accident at work, where my hand was caught in a machine. 
As it happened, I looked at the machine operator and told him, it's a good thing I'm on drugs, or I'd be very mad. Nothing that was happening to me made any difference, as long as I was taking my medicine. I had no idea that I might have a problem with drugs. Many times, I thought that I might be taking too many, but I never thought I would have any problem quitting whenever the pain was gone. I was getting drugs from the drugstore and writing my own scripts at an alarming rate. It was quite a job to record and keep track of all the drugstores I'd used every day. There were times when I'd wish that I would get caught, so I could end the existence I was experiencing. Three days after my discharge from the hospital for my accident at work, my wish came true. In desperation, I tried to pass a bad script that I had written with my hand in a cast. I can't describe the fear that I felt when the druggist made her phone call. Before I knew what was happening, I was in serious trouble. 118 Narcotics Anonymous I considered running, suicide, insanity, anything to help me get out of this jam. I recall the thoughts that I had as I was talking to the police. They were the same thoughts that I'd had many times. Perhaps I could act very innocent and naive. After all this was my first offense. I made a plea to see my doctor. The police could see that I was terrified, and hurting as any drug addict hurts when he can't get drugs. I was told to see the doctor and get help. I instantly thought that I could get over on the law, if they saw that I was serious about getting help. Through the doctor and other friends, I was sent to a drug rehabilitation center back in my home state. This was going to be my ticket out of trouble. I just had to comply with their program, and that's all the law would need to drop charges against me. I went to rehab, knowing that I took too many drugs. While I was doing my time, I was asked, questions like, do you think you're an addict? Do you think you may have a problem with alcohol? How do you deal with anger? I answered these questions with, possibly, no, I've never been angry a day in my life. I knew that I was in trouble when they diagnosed me as a pathological liar. I had many problems facing me when I got out of rehab. The law didn't go away and my wife was very bitter about my activities. My job was on the line because of my inability to function at work, and I didn't have very much money to pay my bills. Many things were happening to me, and I didn't know what to do. The rehabilitation center gave me some tools and knowledge about my drug addiction. I then needed tools to cope with the things that were happening in my life. One of the things that I was told to do in the rehabilitation center was to go to NA meetings, 90 meetings in 90 days. I didn't know what to expect, but I would try them anyway. What did I have to lose? The court also gave me their version of an aftercare plan. It was to attend a meeting every day for 365 days. It was easy to comply with their plan. If I didn't comply, I would go to jail for 7 to 10 years. I was resigned to the fact that I was going to be going to meetings for a while, so I thought I may as well make the best of them. I did the things that were suggested. Now I was going to be clean and serene. Wrong. Thank God I stayed clean, but in the last two years, my serenity has been interrupted on many occasions. After one year clean, 
My wife just couldn't understand why I was still going to meetings every day, leaving her and the children alone so much. Why me? Why not me? 119. When I told her that I planned to attend meetings of Narcotics Anonymous, even after my sentence was fulfilled, she just went absolutely off-center, making sure that I knew she didn't like that at all. I had picked a sponsor by now, and I was constantly crying to him with my problems. He told me to say the serenity prayer. I couldn't believe that he would tell me something so idiotic. How could that help my situation? I was being very negative in all situations in my life. I was told to work the 12 steps of recovery of NA. One thing I had to do was to come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I had known all along that I was powerless over my addiction, and that my life was unmanageable, but I just didn't have the faith that I needed to be restored. The next few months were very tough for me. I got divorced. When I was able to look at the entire scope of my relationship with my wife, I found that we were married for all of the wrong reasons. I had never known what true love or true caring was all about. I was totally selfish in all of my relationships. I was hurt. My ego had been crushed. I was humiliated. I have come to believe that humiliation is nothing more than being humbled against my own will. With this major trauma in my life, I found a power greater than myself. I found, through the fellowship of N.A., that I could either be very miserable with my situation or I could accept it and carry on. All these words still didn't stop the hurt. What finally stopped the hurt and pain that I was feeling was the suggestion that I get active in the fellowship of N.A. I started service work with picking up ashtrays. Now I am able to serve the people who saved my life in various ways. One thing that was given to me from the beginning was the phrase, Keep coming back, it works. Thank God for N.A. Since that time, I have tried to be a little more caring and loving when I deal with people. The first relationship I had with another addict made me see even more how much of my pride, ego, self-centeredness, and lack of faith I still have. The program of NA is a new way of life for me, and it is taking me a long time to learn how to live. You see, I'm as close to death as the person coming off the street, after one day clean. All I have to do is take any form of drug and I'm dead. Today, I am experiencing a freedom that I have never had. This freedom is the idea that no matter what happens to me today, God and I can handle it if I don't use drugs. Sometimes I still want to be a little crazy, especially where women are concerned, but it is getting better. 120 Narcotics Anonymous Jails, Institutions, and Recovery I first came to Narcotics Anonymous in a state prison. It was my third term. In prison over a seven-year period, with only a few months at any one time in the street. One night in this prison I heard of a meeting going on about something to do with drugs. Well, I could relate to this, so I decided to check it out. Besides, it would get me away from the cell for a while. I can remember how confused I was leaving the first meeting. Back in my cell, I dwelled on all those years in and out of jails and all the things that I'd been through just to get loaded. Most of all, I began thinking of how tired I was of living this kind of life. 
This group called Narcotics Anonymous seemed then to be a little too much for me. I told myself that I wasn't a hardcore dope fiend, but just a guy who liked to get loaded every day and a thief who could not stay out of jail. Although in those first meetings I did not see NA as a solution to my craziness, I did hear some things I could relate to. So, I kept going back. I heard the people in NA say that they didn't take drugs anymore, not even grass. I listened. Sure I wanted to stop all the insane situations in my life, but I didn't think I had to give up drugs altogether to do it. I thought that I needed to learn how to handle drugs better. Some of the NA members, who came into the prison to share at these meetings, had been inmates themselves. They attributed the change in their lives to the support of Narcotics Anonymous, one addict sharing and helping another addict. I enjoyed hearing these people tell how it was and how it is today and soon felt a real kinship in the pain that we had all been through. I began respecting these people in NA who talked about how they found a way to live without drugs, alcohol, and jail. I continued to get stoned in the institution whenever and whatever way I could while still attending NA meetings regularly. The members told me to keep coming back no matter what, so I did. Besides, it sure be talking that talk in the yard. 120. Jails, institutions, and recovery 121. Soon I was to be transferred for pre-release to a much looser security prison. I had been there before and had been busted for smoking grass, for which I was sent to a more maximum prison. Now, as I was packing my property for this transfer, I remembered a lot of trouble I had gotten into at this institution, just to use drugs. The man knew me there, and I was pretty nervous now, thinking about being eyeballed from the time I stepped off that bus. I was already thinking hard about getting loaded when I couldn't scared stiff inside knowing what would happen if I got caught again. So I smoked a joint that morning before the long bus ride. I didn't know it then, but it was to be my last. Back in the beginning, when I was attending these NA meetings, I would wonder why it wasn't working for me like it did for others. I was tired of this drug and institutional life, but at that point I guess I wasn't tired enough, because I was still using when I was going to the meeting. I had a decision to make on that bus ride which was paid for by the Department of Corrections. The decision I made that day was mostly out of fear and some things I heard in those first NA meetings. I remember being in that bus, moving down the highway with chains wrapped around my waist and shackles on my feet, uncomfortably looking up at a resentful guard behind a cage with a shotgun. Staring out the window as the miles of freedom passed me by, I wondered why I couldn't be a part of that world. Getting loaded did not feel right anymore. Yet thinking about not taking anything sure felt strange. What a relief, when later I learned that it was easier by doing it just one day at a time. Upon arrival at this other prison I was met by an inmate who was an NA member. I knew him from meetings that we both attended at another prison. It really made a difference to see his face when I drove up because, again, I knew I had the support that would help me make it. I continued in the fellowship at this prison and became active in the service part of the program in the institution. 
During these last six months I had to do on my sentence, I would wake up in the morning and say, just for today, I won't take anything, and I hung with NA people in the institution to keep myself away from temptation. There were plenty of opportunities, so it wasn't easy, but I now had the support of the NA fellowship. Once I was let out to attend an outside meeting, which made me want the fellowship on the outside even more. I started going to the meetings clean for the first time and something happened. The program began to work. 122 Narcotics Anonymous Today I know what makes NA work. One really starts understanding why it can work only when totally abstaining from all mind-altering chemicals. I also was beginning to understand what caring means, by helping each other, we can make it. I felt that the only one who really understood me was another addict. And the only one who could help was a clean addict. I was so proud to stand before the group in prison and announce that I had 90 days clean. Feeling proud was not part of my life before NA. It was such a relief, not having to hustle drugs out on the yard, and do the crazy things that I did to get high. I had never done time like this and it sure felt great. I made another decision through the advice the NA members gave me, which was the second most important decision I had ever made in my life. This decision was to have someone from the NA program at the gate to pick me up when I was released. A person that I knew understood what I needed my first day out, because I sure didn't at this point. When I go back into prisons today to carry the message of Narcotics Anonymous, I suggest that inmates have an NA member at that gate when they get out. I heard so many say, oh, I'll check it out, but I have gotta do this first, or be here first. Don't kid yourself, you might die first if you are an addict like me. That first day out was so righteous. I was taken to a home where NA members were expecting me. This one member gave me a new address book with NA phone numbers in it and said, Give me your old address book, you don't need those old numbers of your connections anymore. Another member took me to his closet, and gave me some clothes. I went to a bunch of meetings that day, and sure received the love and care I needed, which seemed to make up for all the attention I missed while locked up over the years. Recently, one of the many benefits, for me, was being able to stand before the judge of the Superior Court and receive my Certificate of Rehabilitation. I never thought I would be standing in front of any judge for this reason. I am so grateful today to say that I have been able to go beyond the fellowship for the support I need. I'm speaking about God. I mean a God I can understand and talk to when I need a higher strength, the God I found in Narcotics Anonymous. So, if you are in a cell reading this, my message goes to you. If you are wondering whether drugs or booze, or both are screwing up your life, find out where an NA meeting is in your facility and check it out. You might be saving your own life, and learning a better way. If one addict can make it, so can another. We help each other in Narcotics Anonymous. Fearful Mother 123 Fearful Mother I thought an addict was a person who was using hard drugs, someone who was on the streets or in jail. My pattern was different, I got my drugs from a doctor. I knew something was wrong yet I tried to do right, at work, in my marriage and in raising my children. 
I really tried hard. I would be doing well and then I'd fail. It went on like this and each time it seemed like forever. It seemed like nothing would ever change. I wanted to be a good mother. I wanted to be a good wife. I wanted to be involved in society yet never felt a part of it. I went through years of telling my children, I'm sorry but this time it will be different. I went from one doctor to another asking for help. I went for counseling feeling everything will be all right now, but the inside was still saying, what is wrong? I was changing jobs, changing doctors, changing drugs, trying different books, religions and hair colors. I moved from one area to another, changed friends and moved furniture. I went on vacations and also remained hidden in my home. So many things through the years, constantly feeling, I'm wrong, I'm different, I'm a failure. When I had my first child I liked it when they knocked me out, I liked the feeling of the drugs they gave me. It was a feeling that whatever is going on around me, I don't know and I don't care, really. Through the years the tranquilizers gave me the feeling that nothing is really that important. Toward the end, things became so mixed up I was not sure what was and what was not important. I was shaking inside and out. Drugs would not help. I was still trying, but very little. I had quit work and was trying to go back but I couldn't. I would be on the couch afraid of everything. I was 103 pounds and had sores on my lips and in my nose. I had diabetes and shook so that I had a hard time putting a spoon to my mouth. I felt I was out to kill myself and people around me were out to hurt me. Physically and mentally I had a breakdown. I had just become a grandmother and I could not even communicate with a small child. I was almost a vegetable. I wanted to be a part of living but did not know how. Part of me said I'd be better off dead and part of me said there has to be a better way of living. 123. 124 Narcotics Anonymous. When I started on the program of N.A., there were a lot of people who suggested just everyday things for me to do, like eating, taking a bath, getting dressed, going for a walk, going to meetings. They told me, don't be afraid, we have all gone through this. I went to a lot of meetings for the years. One thing has stuck with me, one thing they said from the beginning, Betty, you can stop running and you can be whatever you want to be and do whatever you want to do. Since being on the program I have listened and watched many people and have seen them go through many ups and downs. I have used the teachings I felt were best for me. My work area has had to change and I have been going to school. I have had to relearn all the way back to the grammar school level. It has been slow for me but very rewarding. I also decided that I need to know me better before I can have a meaningful relationship with a man. I am learning to communicate with my daughters. I am trying many things which I wanted to do for years. I am able to remember many things that I had pushed out of my mind. I have found that Betty is not that big pile of nothing but is someone and something that I never really stop to look at or listen to. April 1st, will be my 5th NA birthday. How's that for April Fool's Day? I have been asked to update my story. This April 1st, will be my 10th year birthday. I think, where have I been and have I really grown? I know that I have gotten married. I would like to say I love my husband very dearly, and at times this is hard for me to say. 
Expressing a deep feeling for any person has been very hard for me. I have felt like it would be taken away, or that he would hurt me or laugh at me. That has happened at times, but I have still loved him and it has not been that big and crushing a deal. I am learning not to put him or myself on a pedestal. If I am expecting too much of him that means I had better look a little closer at myself. There are times when we can talk, and there are times it takes time before we can talk. How boring if we both thought alike and everything went smoothly or if we fought constantly. I still get feelings of running away from home, and maybe going back to the islands or Michigan. I have been living in the same place for almost four years. I think that is a record for me. I am still moving furniture around. I love it and would like to put everything on rollers, it would be a lot easier. I still do not understand men. Every once in a while I tell my husband that I am a woman and I need to be taken to a movie or somewhere. I am learning to verbalize my needs to another person. I also go to the show alone. Once in a while. Written in 1981. Fearful Mother 125. I graduated from high school two years ago. I would love to graduate from college, maybe some time in the future. Everyone needs something to look forward to. My daughter, son-in-law and granddaughter gave me a violin for Christmas. When I was in grammar school I took lessons for a very short time. The school stopped giving lessons and took back their violin and I never forgot that. I started out this year by slowly taking lessons and I became obsessed. I was going to two teachers and studying out of three different books. I found myself looking at one of my books and saying, where am I? So now I am back to one teacher and one book. I had a breast operated on and they removed part of it. I will not say this was a whiz because it wasn't, but I was luckier than some. I had the N.A. program and people to walk through it with me. I cannot say my life has been like tiptoeing through the tulips, because that is not reality. I can say that my life is now getting better and I am more open to looking and walking in reality. With the world in such a turmoil, I feel I have been blessed to be where I am. I look at how NA has grown. We are in Germany, Australia, England, Scotland, Italy, Brazil, etc. Maybe someday we will reach the countries that are so damn hard to reach. I have been told there are not many women with a lot of time on the program. I am surprised when I hear this. I just assume there are and maybe they have moved to other cities and states. Maybe even to some of these countries that are so damn hard to reach. When a woman wants something bad enough, look out, she can move heaven and hell. One of the first things said to me was, no one else in this world knows what you want, but you. If you want to survive in this world you had better do what is right for you, because no one else is going to do it. I get bumps and bruises and I suck my thumb once in a while, but I sure get stronger each time. I have a dog named Baba Wawa, she was very tiny when my daughter gave her to me. My daughter said, Mom, here is a little dog and she will never grow very large. Well, she has grown very big and she surprises me every once in a while. Last night she tried to fight a big dog right through a chain link fence. I thought she was still a puppy, but she can stand her own. I guess it's like me. 
I have grown more than I realized and, unlike Baba Wawa, I have been known to climb the fence and go after whatever I want. I have also been known to knock those fences down. I feel like there is more to say, but who can put all of 10 years down on paper? I would rather spend my time living it than writing it. 126 Narcotics Anonymous I have been active in NA answering phones, typing, and working in different areas of NA. I go to meetings and talk and still feel funny and awkward. Sometimes I am a kid, all hyper, other times it goes so smoothly that I can't remember what happened or what I said, but I feel good. What I am trying to say is, thank heaven nothing is as bad as it used to be and there is so much more of what there should be in my life. I found the only NA, meeting in the world 127. I found the only NA, meeting in the world. My name is Bob B from Los Angeles. On the subject of people, places and things, my story is not much different from the executive, it's just on the opposite end of the stick. I grew up on the wrong side of the track, or, deprived, during the depression, in a broken home. The words of love were never spoken in my household. There were a lot of kids in my house. Most of the things I remember about my life are recalled in retrospect. While they were happening, I didn't know anything about it. I just remember going through life feeling different, feeling deprived. I never felt quite comfortable wherever I was, with whatever I had at any given time. I grew up in a fantasy world. Things on the other side of the fence always look better. My grass was never green enough. My head was always out to lunch. I learned all the shortcuts in order to make it through school. I always had a dream of leaving home. It was not the place to be. My great fantasy was that there was going to be something good out there somewhere. I started using drugs fairly late in life. I was 18 years old. I say late in comparison with the age kids are doing it today. My mother ruled her house with a big stick. That was her method. The constant way I gained attention was by getting my butt whipped on a daily basis. I found another way to get attention was to get sick. When I got sick I got the things I felt were necessary, love and attention. I blamed my mother because she didn't make better choices in her life so that I could have been happy growing up. I went into the military because it was a place to run. I stayed in the military for a long time because they afforded me the same opportunities I had at home. Three hot, a cot, and no responsibility. I can say I was a responsible person because I had rank and did this or that, but it was only because they gave me advanced directions on what to do, when to do it, and how much to do. 127. 128 Narcotics Anonymous. My first drug was alcohol. I found that there were two personalities. When under the influence of alcohol and, later other narcotics, there was a personality change. I found out later, however, that this personality change went back even farther. I was two people before I even started using. I had learned how to steal early. I had learned how to lie early. I had learned how to cheat early. I used these processes successfully. I was addicted to stealing long before I was addicted to drugs because it made me feel good. If I had some of your goodies to spread around, I felt good. I had a thing about stealing. 
I couldn't go into a place unless I took something. I was so naive, I knew nothing about drugs. Drugs were not something that were talked about in the 1930s and 1940s. It is not that drugs have changed, they just didn't talk about them before. They didn't talk about sex, or drugs, or religion, or discuss or explain them. It just wasn't one of those things that was talked about. I first experienced my drug of choice, heroin, in the Far East. I heard about opium and tried that. I found that you could cook up heroin and put it in a spike. There were a great variety of drugs in other countries that you could get by just walking into a drug store and asking for them. So I stayed out of the country for nine years. That way I wasn't confronted with the attitudes and restrictions in the United States. I knew nothing about the progression of my disease. I knew nothing about addiction. I ran around in the ignorance of addiction for a lot of years, not knowing, just not knowing. No one explained to me that when you use drugs over a year's time you can get hooked. No one told me about withdrawal from drugs. The only thing anyone told me was, don't get sick, and the way to do that was to keep on using. One of the problems I found in the military was that they give you orders, ship you out, and they don't send your connection with you. You get sick. You try to back that up the next time by trying to get a big enough supply, and your month's supply lasts a week, or two or three days. I knew nothing about progression of the disease nor the consequences of my actions. The progression of my disease caught up with me, as far as the military was concerned, when I started transporting and smuggling. Also, when you use drugs to the extent that you can't be there for duty, they frown on it. The next thing they do is take you away and lock you up. Then the military did a cruel thing, they put me out on the street. I found the only N.A. meeting in the world 129. I was ill-equipped to take care of myself. I had gone from one mama to another mother. They had taken care of me, then I found myself on the street with no one to take care of me. I knew nothing of paying rent, working or being responsible. So I had to give that responsibility to whoever I could give it to. I ran through a lot of mothers. I had to learn how to hustle on the street. You have to realize that the military has a lot of equipment that can be sold and I used to sell it, because I like to steal. I had to learn other processes, like running through stores winning stakes and cigarettes under my arm jumping from second story windows, and running from policemen. I think there is a certain excitement that goes along with drug addiction. It was a lot like my childhood games of cops and robbers. I found out that there are more policemen than drug addicts. They were standing around watching you. I could never understand how they could go into a crowd of people and pick me out, and say, let's get in the car, let's go. Nine times out of ten they had me dirty. During the process of finding mothers, one mother found me. I thought I should hem this one up and get papers on her, then she couldn't run away. I chose correctly. I chose someone who wasn't using. I knew about the ones that were using. They were never there when I got locked up. They never had bail money. They could never visit because they were too busy taking care of their own habits. So I found one of those unsuspecting ones. She was in school and working and she had a place to stay. 
She had one shortcoming. She didn't know she needed someone to take care of. I was a prime candidate. I wanted to be taken care of. She was going to help me get my act together. She proposed to me in jail and I said, yes, I do. Just go down and pay the bail. For the next three years I ran her crazy trying to keep up with me. Then she went out and found the only Narcotics Anonymous meeting in the world. How she did that, I don't know. At that time, there was only one meeting in the whole world, and she went out and found it, and I sent her off to the meeting. I had her go check it out. You have to realize that in those days, drug addicts were very unpopular. To just intimate that two drug addicts were going to congregate anywhere would constitute a police stakeout. That's the way they treated drug addicts at the time. There was very little understanding about addiction. I was very leery about anything to do about helping drug addicts. I knew what they did with drug addicts. They locked them up, period. There was no program to go to, except in featuring, Worth and Lexington, 130 Narcotics Anonymous. I always had a sad story to justify my using. One day, after one of those six-month trips to go get a loaf of bread at the corner grocery, I came home and my bags were sitting by the door. She had told me fifty times or a thousand times, you got to go. This time was different, there was something in her voice this time. So I took my bags and went to the only place there was to go, the street. I had become accustomed to living in the street. I knew how to live in the back of old cars, old laundry rooms, any old empty building, your house or my house. Of course, I never had my house. I couldn't pay the rent. I never knew how to pay rent. If I had three dollars in my pocket, that three dollars was going for drugs before a place to stay. It was that simple. I think I paid rent one time while I was using drugs and living on the street, that was just to move in. It was called, Catch Me If You Can, from then on. It usually didn't make any difference, because I was a ward of the state much of the time anyway. I just ran in the streets until they locked me up, then I had a place to stay. I could rest up, and get my health back in order to go back out and do it again. I came to Narcotics Anonymous nearly 21 years ago, written in 1981, but I didn't come for me. I came just to keep her mouth shut. I went to meetings loaded. I didn't have a driver's license. I was unemployable. I had no place to stay. I was the wrong color. I had no money. I didn't have a car. I didn't have an old lady, or I needed a new one. I took them all these problems and they would tell me, keep coming back. And they said, work the steps. I used to read the steps and thought that that was working them. I found out years later that even though I read the steps, I didn't know what I had read. I did not understand what I read. They told me in many places that I was an addict. I had been labeled an addict. From the military, to the jails, and right on down the line, I had been labeled. I accepted this, but I didn't understand it. I had to go out and do some more experimenting before I got back to the program. One of the things I had to learn to do was to understand what the program was all about. I had to become willing to find out what the program was about. Only after standing at the gates of death did I want to understand.
I think death is the council permanent. I had overdosed a number of times, but that was kind of like the place where I always wanted to be. It was just before going over the brink and everything seemed okay. When I came out of it, I could say, wow, give me some more. That's insanity. I found the only NA meeting in the world 131. The final case for me was that I was about to be shot off a fence, and not by my own doing. I didn't like that. Playing cops and robbers is dangerous out there. They have guns, and I don't like being used for target practice. There were more and more cases of policemen sticking guns in my mouth and upside my head, and telling me to lay upside a wall. My last day of narcotics use or drugs of any type, I had just fixed and two policemen got me spread eagled on a chain link fence that I was trying to get over. I became sober and clean immediately. Everything became very clear and I didn't want to die that way. Something clicked on in my mind and I thought, it doesn't have to be this way. After that last rest and recuperation, I found out that I could work these steps. The sum total of my life has changed as a direct result. I got involved in working the steps, trying to understand what they were talking about, to really understand what they were talking about. I found there is a certain amount of action that goes with every step. I had to get into action about how the steps apply to me. I always thought the steps applied to you, not me. It got down to talking about God and spirituality. I had canned God a long time ago, then I put that in church, and I didn't have anything to do with church. I found out that God and spirituality have nothing to do with church. I had to learn to get involved. It has been one hell of an adventure. My life has changed to such an extent that it is almost unbelievable that I was ever there. However, I know from where I came. I have constant reminders. I need that constant reminder of newcomers and talking with others. This program has become a part of me. It has become a part of life and living for me. I understand more clearly the things that are happening in my life today. I no longer fight the process. I came to meetings of Narcotics Anonymous in order to take care of the responsibilities that have been given to me. Today, I care, I am addicted to the loving and caring and sharing that goes on in NA. I look forward to more of these things in my life. My problem is addiction, it has something to do with drugs being the means of not coping with life, it has something to do with that within, that compulsion and that obsession. I now have the tools to do something about it. The 12 steps of recovery are the tools. 132 Narcotics Anonymous Alien From a very early age I had an intense feeling and belief that I was different. And while other girls my age were trying on mom's clothes and playing with Barbie dolls, I was playing football with the guys, smoking pot, and pondering the mysteries of the universe. I started moving somewhere close to the age of 12. My parents were concerned about the drug problem in our neighborhood, so I was enrolled in a semi-private school in featuring Lauderdale, Florida, all this big was introduced me to a more sophisticated drug use. There are many years of my life that I can't remember, and some I wish I could forget. Some periods have come back to me in recovery, but many have not. I have been a skeptic from a very early age. 
I questioned everything, everything was musing. I used to completely block out any feelings and perceptions that I had toward life. I never was very fond of living, although I wanted to be, and this became evident as the years rolled past and my self-destructive behavior magnified itself. At one time in my life I decided that sports was the avenue of personal freedom and acceptance that I desired. And so the addict within me attacked the sports world with vigor and determination. I also felt that if I could succeed at something, and be the best at it, I would surely get somebody's attention. I succeeded in society's eyes and in my peers' eyes. My name was in the papers, and I was on the All-State team twice, received an All-American nomination, was team captain, I had plaques, trophies, and titles. Regardless of my success in sports, I was feeling empty and the success didn't really matter to me. In fact, it turned out to be more of a hassle than it was worth. I was beginning to hear an endless monologue. You have so much potential, why are you messing up your life? Even with my intense physical training, I simply could never stop using. In fact, I thought that using drugs enhanced my ability in sports, and they also became a reward after a hard workout. I did not attend my senior year in high school. Most of my friends had either quit, been kicked out or had already graduated. 132. Alien 133. I was born and raised in the Miami featuring Lauderdale area. So, at age 15 I had enough of geographic stability. My heart beat was travel, and I diligently pursued the road. I spent one winter in a tent in the high Sierras of California. It was at this time that I was introduced to the drug of all drugs, peyote. The next few years were spent in a desperate attempt to match that particular experience. Still, the main question I addressed to myself was, who am I and where in this universe do I fit? I alienated myself from my family. I did not think that I belonged with them any more than I belonged in this straight up society. My main outlet was writing, and I retreated farther and farther into the world of isolation. I did, through the years, try to make things work for myself. I became a Christian, was baptized, chanted to Krishna, became a Christian again, stared at Maharishi Yogi, went to Bible college, got kicked out, went back, got kicked out again. I went to school for training as an emergency medical technician, started nursing school and still felt unfulfilled. This world was just not doing its job to fulfill my every need. I still never felt like I fit into the plan of the universe, and my disease of addiction progressed. Thinking back, I think it was why I used, as well as how much I used, that gave me problems. I went from California to Florida to get clean, and when that didn't work, I went to North Carolina, and then to Connecticut and on and on. When I became uncomfortable somewhere, I moved elsewhere. The same went for my employment situation. When I didn't like my job, or I was getting close to being caught at ripping an establishment off, I would simply get another job. Geography was not adequate armor to fight the war that was taking place in my mind, body and spirit. I spent a summer on the Amazon River of Brazil. That did not cure my addiction. Even in the Andes of Peru my addiction progressed. I learned that custom officials love to see Bibles in your luggage, and they also 
also love to hear that your item of business in a particular country was church or missionary affiliated. A few months before I found the program, I was working in retail and found a wonderful supplier for my habits, my manager. Now all I had to do was to make it to work. In fact, all of a sudden, work was not all that bad. I began to work 14 hour days. It was my perpetual and ultimate connection, and life became more blurry every day. I found myself doing things for drugs that I didn't want to do. But I did anything that I had to do to stay high. Music became so much a part of my routine that, at one point, it was accepted behavior to cut lines of cocaine on the restaurant. 134 Narcotics Anonymous Table I became oblivious to the fact that what I was doing was illegal. I never could figure out why it seemed like people were always staring at me. I remember thinking, God grant me the power to change the people, places, and things that do not agree with my way of thinking. I could never figure out why this world would not devote itself to making me happy. Today I realize this is insane thinking, and insane thinking helped qualify me for the program of Narcotics Anonymous. Insane thinking is one of the obvious characteristics of the disease of addiction. I had an ideal vision of the world as I thought it should be. I often visualized myself as existing on a moonbeam in a utopian state for eternity. I have always been a baby in an adult body. I want what I want, when I want it. Finally, in Atlanta, Georgia, I found a program of Narcotics Anonymous. Psychiatry was not helping. Prescribed medication did nothing but make me want more. When I was doing amphetamine, the doctor would put me on tranquilizers to calm me down, and when I was going down, I was put on antidepressants to help stabilize my mood swings and depression. At one point, I remember being told, just face it, you will never be able to live without being on some kind of medication. Depression eventually became my normal state of mind and spirit. Suicide remained my dominating thought. My favorite pastimes were hanging over an interstate overpass or seeing how close I could get to moving trains. My social life was non-existent, and my zest for life was so low I even lost the energy it took to get more drugs. My bottom had arrived and somehow I was still alive. My therapist at this point was a lady who understood the disease of addiction. She refused to continue seeing me if I would not attend a Narcotics Anonymous meeting. I went to a few meetings and told her that there was no way the program could work for me. When she wouldn't buy that excuse, I told her that I thought the people were using because there was no way in my mind that people could look and sound so happy, and have so much freedom, without being loaded. I remember sitting in a survivor's meeting one night and asking the guy next to me, are these people for real or are they all loaded? He looked at me rather emphatically, and replied, they are for real. Then there was the higher power concept. For me, having had two years of Bible college, and a lot of theology in my head, I confused spirituality with religion. This was one of my biggest obstacles in developing conscious contact with a power greater than myself. My struggle became Alien 135. Evident when at a meeting where a higher power was the topic, I told them, I don't believe in a power greater than myself, and I am sick of hearing this topic discussed. 
After about two minutes of silence, the guy across the room stood up, walked over to me, and whispered in my ear, I know where you're coming from, and I want to tell you that this group of people is a power greater than you. That was the foundation for my concept of a higher power. Today I choose to call my higher power God. Yet there are many times today when the group is used. God, as I understand him today, is a gentle, loving, and understanding spirit. I believe today that my higher power kept me alive long enough to find the fellowship of Narcotics Anonymous. I am grateful to be alive. The day I surrendered to the fact that I was powerless over my addiction and enormous gave was removed from me. The addiction said, who can handle this, but I knew I couldn't. One of the hardest things that I have encountered is change. I have had to change my playground and playmates. For me, that was one of the easier areas of change. It was true on day one, and remains so today, essential for ongoing recovery. What has been hardest is changing attitudes, ideas, patterns, and reactions. When I encounter people today who don't agree with me, I need to try and respond to them in a spirit of love. This is quite a change from ignoring them as I did in the past. As a result of working my program, going to meetings, changing my attitude, and relying on my higher power instead of people, even my face is changing. When I first came into the program, one of my fellow addicts nicknamed me, Rocky, due to my stern facial expression. I showed no emotion, would not smile, even if I was laughing on the inside, and refused to talk. There were also many times when I simply could not talk, and could do nothing but make a meeting and listen. Many times I shuffled into the meeting, and sat in my corner, and hoped that no one saw me. I sometimes held on to the fantasy that I was a type of Casper the Pope. The reality was that people really did see me. They tried to talk to me, and they tried to hug me, regardless of my stone face expression. Eventually, love broke through and I began to respond to the people that God was using as instruments of His love and grace. What matters is that the program I have found gives me the tools to live clean, regardless of pain, whether it be emotional, spiritual, or physical. It is okay to hurt and feel pain today.